The holiday season is a time for miracles. You make a long trip on a train to take a job working with a family who really needs your help. After all, that family isn't doing much to connect with their deaf and blind daughter. That's going to be your job. Not that I would know what to do with an angry young Helen Keller who feels trapped in a world all on her own. And it's not like Annie Sullivan has the patience of Job. She reaches the end of her rope more than once in this movie. My own rope would have been reached much earlier. Yours too. <laughs> so to get through this experience and break through to someone who desperately needs a breakthrough would probably require some delicious help each and every morning. And that assistance can and should come in the form of Sparkplug Coffee. Sparkplug is our sponsor and they offer the freshest, fairly traded, premium Arabica beans in Canada. They've got many blends and roasts, including rotating seasonal blends. And they've also got decaf and half-calf options. After all, not everyone needs to be hepped up on stimulants, especially when you're already a bit of an a-hole, whether you have a good reason to be a little jerk or not. And she does, but still. Now, how do you get this fine substance? Well, Sparkplug delivers to customers in the U.S. and Canada within a week. And those of us who live in the land of A, A, will get free shipping. But what will make you sit up and take notice is when you hear that being a member of Sparkplug's Autopilot Coffee Club will nab you perks and deals. And hey, you'll save money on every order. You can even customize that membership to get orders when it suits you. So what more proof do you need that it's not a run-of-the-mill Coffee of the Month Club? Friends, you've got some typing to do. Sparkplug.coffee slash H-Y-E-S into your device and you will save 20% off your next order. Use our H-Y-E-S promo code. Save a little money. All right, let's make this movie review happen now. Bev, let Andrew know it's time to play us in. And action! Have you ever seen... The Miracle Worker. By the way, the Christmas theme there, but not really a Christmas movie, but it is December, so we're sticking with that theme. Hi there, film chums, and thank you for downloading, streaming, or somehow stumbling across the 554th Have You Ever Seen podcast. We spoil classic movies in these sometimes lengthy reviews, so be ready for that. I bet today's review won't be very lengthy. (laughs) (laughs) I'm the guy with bad eyes, but pretty good hearing, although I do like to fight in the dining room, Ryan Ellis. And here's my wife, who often wears dark glasses and sometimes wants to strangle my doll, but never strangles me, the somewhat deaf Bev. What? That's me. Touche. Okay, the coming attractions trivia for The Miracle Worker. Apparently, Anne Bancroft said that Arthur Penn, who directed her to an Oscar in The Miracle Worker, was the person who had the greatest impact on her career. What was the next legendary project they did together? Did they ever? This is one of my sneaky trick questions. (laughs) They never worked together again. They had worked together before, because first of all, he directed her in the stage play. Yeah, okay, I'm thinking movies, but all right. All right. Penn directed about a dozen more films after this, never cast her, which was Penn's M.O. He often worked with big stars like Paul Newman, Jane Fonda, Robert Redford, Dustin Hoffman, and Jack Nicholson, but only once each. Originally, I had Brando on this list, but then I looked up and thought, wait a minute, isn't he also in The Chase? Because Nicholson and Brando did, oh God, the name, The Missouri Breaks, infamous movie where Brando is just such a prima donna, but he worked with Brando more than once at least. All right, Tough Love was released stateside by United Artists on July 28th, 1962. What a summer movie. But of course, back then, they didn't really think about summer movies the way they did about 13 years later when Jaws came out. It didn't lose money for UA, but it wasn't a gangbusters hit either. But Beverly, this movie is a little more than 60 years old. So before it can apply for old age benefits, please tell us what it's about and give us a skinny on The Miracle Worker. Patty Duke is Helen Keller, a deaf and blind child. Her parents have no idea how to help her and are desperate to keep her out of an institution. So they hire Anne Bancroft's Anne Sullivan, a mostly blind former student of the Perkins School for the Blind. Anne has her work cut out for her as Helen has no interest in being taught manners along with language. And the two have an epic battle of the wills. But Helen is no match for Anne's perseverance as she eventually gets the stubborn child to make the connection between language and the world around her. Or, in a nutshell, are any of you Helen Keller's up for adoption? (laughs) (laughs) I think after the notorious nine-minute battle scene in the dining room and it finally ended and you and I sigh and we look at each other and I was like, let's have one. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. This would be telling tales of a school a few years ago, but your stepsister is estranged anyway, and we don't think that your, well, parents, but stepmother, or these people we're about to talk about ever listen to this anyway. I set it up by saying all that to say that your stepsister, 
with her Asperger's or whatever the hell they call it now, if she was cured tomorrow, would still be a little jerk. A grown jerk now. And her husband wouldn't be, I don't think. I'll say they tried everything. I feel like my stepmom probably watched The Miracle Worker and took it as instructional. Not that she was ever violent with her, but took the tough love approach. And if it was ever going to work, it didn't. It wasn't her disability making her a piece of work. She was just a piece of work. Yeah, and Helen Keller seems like that kind of person, too. Although she should have been six, and Patty Duke is 16, but she played it on stage. She was probably a little more age-appropriate, still too old, but more so. But then they wanted to cast the experienced actress. I didn't really dwell on that. A, I didn't know that, and who else probably did in 1962? I didn't know how old she was supposed to be. Right. You look it up, and then you know that, sure. She seems also like a child. She doesn't seem like a teenager. She could pass for a lot younger than 16, that's true. And also, Annie Sullivan should be 20, not about 30, like Bancroft is. But then Bancroft, in her most famous movie with Dustin Hoffman, she plays his mother's friend. Now, she's supposed to be younger than her husband and then those friends, granted. But she's barely older than Hoffman. So, I'm like seven years older than he well, was. She has a daughter Hoffman's age. So, even if she was 20 when her daughter was born, that still means she has 20 years on Hoffman's character. Yeah. Also, Hoffman was just too old for that movie. And that's the only other time we've ever covered Anne Bancroft. One of the reasons I want to do this movie. Also, the Oscars they both got. We'll get to that in a second. It's on the Cheers list and so on. So, there we go. So, the Rotten Tomatoes critics on this film. 96% of them like this movie. There are only 26 reviews on the site. And the average is 7.9 out of 10. So, that's one of those things where the percentage is very high. But then the actual average is good, but a lot lower. And 88% of audiences. 8. 8. I don't know where it ranked at the 62 U.S. box office. Like I said, it did okay, I guess. It's hard to find numbers when you get back into the 60s when it comes to box office. But I did see on, must have been the numbers or maybe Wikipedia, that Lawrence of Arabia was number two, To Kill a Mockingbird was number seven, and The Manchurian Candidate was number 16. All three of those made the AFI's greatest movies of all time list. And they all should have. The Manchurian Candidate, for some reason, wasn't on the second list. And just briefly, those four films, as great as Lawrence is, as great as Mockingbird is, and people might love this movie too, which would you rather watch tomorrow? Oh my God, Manchurian Candidate. And it got no knocked contest. off. Yeah, that's a mistake. So this movie won the two Oscars for the two women, Anne Bancroft for Best Actress and Patty Duke for Best Supporting Actress. Really, in a way, it's a two-hander, but they can't... Well, they could have been up for the same award like they were in many movies. I guess All About Eve is a great example, Anne Baxter and Betty Davis. Betty Davis is really the supporting player in that movie, but it's a great performance, and she's the star. I bet Patty Duke was easily shunted into Supporting Actress simply because she doesn't speak. It's a bit of a factor. Well, only she minutes. speaks one word at the end of the film, but... There are very few people that have ever actually won Oscars for not speaking in movies. She was, I believe, the first. Did Holly Hunter win for the piano? Yeah. Oh, there you go. There's an example. Also, with a very young actor winning Best Supporting Actress in True. that film. Hunter may have spoke, because I saw something about this and didn't write the names down, but John Mills and Ryan's daughter is one of these people. And maybe Hunter was the third? What's his name in Coda? The father. Troy Kotzer. I think he does speak. Yeah, he does, right. He's definitely but he's, does I mean, speak. he's speaking throughout the whole film because he's using sign language. But I, mean, he but actually, I guess so is Hollywood. He actually does speak, though, with his voice. Yeah, yeah. Because we're talking about voice, not ASL. As for the Oscars, so it was nominated for three more. Arthur Penn for Best Director, his first of three. He was nominated for Bonnie and Clyde, as he should have been. Maybe should have even won. Probably should have won for that movie. And then again for Alice's Restaurant a couple years after that. William Gibson, who's a playwright, not really a screenwriter, was nominated for Best Adapted Screenplay, and Ruth Morley's Black and White Costumes were nominated, so the movie, of course, isn't Black and White. And she designed costumes for seven movies we've covered. Didn't write them all down, but this is the seventh, I guess. We talked about this when we did, I believe, last year... What is it called? The movie where they feuded. Whatever happened to Baby Jane? Joan Crawford accepted Bancroft's Oscar. Bancroft was on the stage, I think, maybe doing, well, probably something else, not this. Well, yeah, she had done the play before this. Or wait, did she do the play? Anyway, she was on stage. And that was to spite Betty Davis, partly. Maybe they were, it must have been friends, because it's not like Crawford could say, I'm taking your Oscar for you, whether you like it or not. Obviously, Bancroft either was okay with it or picked her. And then Crawford read the speech. Bancroft basically wanted to thank the director, the writer, and the producer. So the director was Penn, the writer was Gibson, the producer was Fred Coe. Patty Duke also won, of course. She seemed overwhelmed. All she said was, I think all I heard in this really old clip on YouTube was, thank you. That's appropriate, though, for her to barely speak when she goes up to win her award, isn't it? Ryan Mills, uh, not Ryan Mills, John Mills. If I said Ryan a few minutes ago, it's John Mills who won for Ryan's daughter. Anyway, I think he said either nothing or one word or something like that, the implication being that I didn't speak in the movie, so I shouldn't speak now. This movie is on the cheers list. It was 15th. It's Wonderful Life, or appropriate for this season, was number one. And it was nominated for the Top 100 Heroes and Villains list. Annie Sullivan is a hey, villain. <laughs> no, she was nominated for the Top 50 Heroes. She I is... mean, Helen Keller could be a villain. <laughs> <laughs> 
Yeah, that's probably true, yeah. And the top 25 music scores. All right, you've never seen this movie before. I've seen it once. It was a long time ago. Of course, it's based on real story, as we obviously know. I meant to look up the Helen Keller stuff and didn't do it. I did. So you'll be the expert here. Whatever I remember from reading her Wikipedia page. All right, fair enough. <laughs> and I did look up some YouTube stuff, too, because there's actually video of her just living in the world. Oh, okay. Yeah, it's quite fascinating, actually. It's a very well-made movie. It's very good, and yet it's been not even a week, and I don't remember all that well. <laughs> it's maybe the best example I can think of we've ever had where I would have to give the movie a thumbs up, and you should watch it, and these actresses deserve all your respect and praise, but... It's not that I didn't care, but I might struggle to remember a lot about this thing. So go ahead. Tell us what you thought. I really thought that the movie was going to be a chore. It always seemed like this stuffy classroom film to me. And I've never before this really been all that interested in Helen Keller as a subject. But I was pleasantly surprised how much I really liked it. It's not boring or preachy. It's actually really dynamic and gutsy at points. And I'll, of course, join the millions of people praising these two performances. They're truly mind-blowing. But yeah, when I was doing the research and I was reading about the plot, I honestly was like, oh yeah, I totally forgot about that scene. And it had been literally days mm -hmm. since we'd seen the movie. But the scenes that stick in your mind, I feel like I'm going to remember for the rest of my life. Maybe. I mean, two scenes in particular, but really this scene where they're fighting in the dining room. Mm -hmm. It's nine minutes long and it made an absolutely massive impression on me. And if it was the only good thing in the whole film, it still would make the movie worth watching. I guess the scenes out in the cottage are pretty memorable too. You know what, this movie maybe works as well as it does as well. I think you probably have to agree with this because we're both cynical in many ways in life <laughs> and about our films. We've seen so many, we've covered so many. It's because she doesn't have the patience of Job. She gets mad at Helen. It's not a matter of whatever it takes, go ahead and do it. And Helen isn't the perfect victim. We said a few minutes ago about your stepsister. Yes, she has something that's not in her control, and we sympathize with that. But she's also, or at least was, I'm sure this hasn't changed, it's probably worse, not a nice person, not a person you'd ever want to hang around if she was just magically fine. I think Helen's the same. If she wasn't, well, she wasn't born deaf and blind. It happened when she was an infant. She was sick or something. She then... was 19 months old. They don't know what she had, but they suspect it was meningitis. Oh, okay. She should have died, but she survived and lost her son. Actually, you know, as I say that, though, one thing i got to give her some slack on is that if all she really ever knew, although 19, she would have known the world a little bit, I guess. Well, 19, she was, 19 months. I mean. She started speaking, right? She knew Wawa. She knew water. Okay. Well, I was going to say, though, that if all you've ever known is to not be able to hear or see at all, and a family that's interested in you but not truly dedicated to getting to know you in your terms, which they'd have to, then maybe you're going to be more obstinate. But it does seem like this person was also hard to deal with anyway and would have been if she'd just been fine her whole life. This is just a smart girl who grew up to be an incredibly intelligent woman who obviously could never sit still and never stop learning. So imagine having the type of brain that would accomplish all the things that Helen Keller accomplished with her restrictions and then put that in the body of someone who can't even communicate with someone. And the frustration would be unimaginable. And then you have a family that just, I don't see it as negligence. I think they loved her, especially her mother. Yeah. Her father, different story, but he's almost put in there to be an antagonist. I don't really trust that this portrayal is what her father was like. He's just kind of a convenient foil to get in the way of their progress. We've seen far worse fathers in movies or in reality, though, than this guy. I'm just saying the way he was written was just so convenient for the plot that I wouldn't trust that this movie has any bearing in reality. Yeah. Whereas the conflict with the mother is much more heartfelt because her conflict is that she loves her daughter and she pities her. And, and she that's panders her to mistake. her. And she panders to her because, well, when she loses her sight and hearing, she's a toddler. Of course, you're just going to do everything for her. Yeah. And I can see how that would just snowball until you have a child who's so spoiled and everybody's so used to accommodating her. Another memorable scene in the film is just a scene where she's eating dinner by helping herself to what's on everybody's plate and just yeah. running around making huge with her mess hands. with her hands like an animal, like it's feral. Mm -hmm. And everybody's treating it like it's perfectly normal. And I can see how, yeah, maybe they tried, but she pitches a fit and they're like, well, it's just not worth it. We all know parents like this. We all know people with, like, out-of-control dogs. They just can't bear to discipline the dogs. And sorry, I shouldn't compare her to a dog, but we all know people with spoiled children. We all know people who, even with the best intentions, don't know what to do. How could they possibly know what to do? I would argue that nobody would do what Ann Sullivan did now, even though it worked. She hit her back. 
a few times. She got hit pretty hard. Violent. Yeah. She's withholding food from her. There's no respect for boundaries. There's certainly no aspect of consent on any level. What year does this take place? Like the late 1900s, early. I think it's late 1800s. 20th century. Late. No. Sorry. Yeah, I meant the late 19th century. There's not much on Wikipedia as we found out about the movie itself. Yeah, it's surprisingly well, we little know, it written about that. this film at I all. I think the book that Keller wrote was 1903, so it must well, be Well, Patty 19th. Duke met Helen Keller. She was an old woman when she met okay. her, so it has to be late 19th century. That's just how people raise kids anyway. Yes. So it's a movie made in the 60s about events that happened when we were young, near the turn of the century. That was still happening. Well, yeah, exactly. So Anne Sullivan really does believe she's doing what's best by her, but nobody would ever do that now. And... Helen's parents knew even less of what to do with her. There was no protocol of how to raise a deafblind child. Most people really did just put them in institutions. And when they describe what happened to those institutions, it's terrible. The world has become a much better and safer place for everybody, but especially people as vulnerable as Helen Keller was. By the way, a bit of a sidebar on all this. We want to do Christmas movies in December, of course. I think we always have, if not entirely, then mostly. Well, no, not always entirely, because we've done things like one of the Tarantino movies, I think, we did in December. But I was validated by the fact that we have a very brief 10-second scene where Helen, who's five, whatever years old, maybe younger, goes up to a ball on a tree and I think drops it, right? And you can tell it's a Christmas ball on a Christmas tree. So, in some ways, very briefly, <laughs> Christmas movie. Most of the events of this film take place in the summer, but <laughs> hey, miracle, Christmas, yeah. connection. <laughs> well, Nightmare Before Christmas, I thought maybe we would do next week. But I pulled it because we've done so many 1993 movies lately. And I didn't really feel like we had to cover that. So instead we'll do, we'll talk about this at the end of the podcast, but trading places for a few reasons. We'll get into that a little later on. But yeah, trying to find Christmas movies at this point is getting harder because we've covered so many of the great ones and a lot of the good ones. But back to The Miracle Worker. Also, that title, Jesus, A Miracle Worker. Right. It's his birthday in two weeks after this gets posted. So there's that (laughs) connection too. All right, connection's over. One of the key things about this, too, is based on reality, I think, that Annie Sullivan had eye trouble herself. She often wears dark glasses in this movie, and she is, quote-unquote, blind. Now, she can see, but I guess she'd be what we call now legally blind. And she said that she could only see because she had had many operations and that when she was a child, she was blind, which is how she ended up at the Institute for the Blind. And that's how she knows how to connect in any kind of way, or maybe so. But that's an important touch, too, they could base on reality, because otherwise it does seem like this woman, well, she's getting paid, but she's just a saint who does lose her patience, but she can connect in that way, too. That's one of the smart touches. I think people with disabilities know something that those of us who don't have disabilities don't really understand. The world's getting a lot smarter about this. But for a lot of my life, if I learned somebody was blind, I would feel bad for them. I would pity them. I would assume that their world had gotten significantly smaller when they lost their sight, when in reality, people with disabilities lead big, fulfilling lives and are really capable of a lot. They're not capable of seeing. It's going to limit what they can do. But there's this notion that they can't learn anymore, and she knows better. The advantage that her disability gives her is that she would never pity Helen because she knows that she didn't deserve pity. Pity never helped her when she was growing up. What she needed was just like a teacher who met her on her level. also helps that this family is wealthy. Well, Helen Keller herself in later years admitted that her life would have looked very different if she hadn't have been wealthy. She probably wouldn't have lived very long. No one's paying for Annie to come do this if they're not wealthy. Anne Sullivan lived with her for the rest of Anne Sullivan's life. Oh, I didn't know that. They were companions for the rest of Anne's life. Okay. I think this is just the most lovely sentiment that Helen Keller said that the day she came, I think she said it was like October 7th, I can't remember the year, was the day that she considered her true birthday. Yeah. was the day that Anne Sullivan entered her life. Well, when they first meet, they connect. But Helen slaps her pretty early on. I think just Helen does that in general. And whacks her with her doll and draws blood. And then Annie locks her in. One of the reasons why this works, I guess, is that <laughs> it takes a while at least. But Helen realizes that she's not going to get whatever she wants to, like she did with her mother especially, but even from her father and her brother. The father more of indifference than the brother because he just doesn't really know what to do exactly. The movie's supposedly about her teaching language, and she does teach language, but the real conflict of the film is teaching her to, I don't want to say submit. Submit is the wrong word because she's not a soldier that she's trying to train, but... She does have to break her down like soldiers do, though. Yeah, she does. 
she has to teach her manners. She has to teach her discipline. When you're a child, you have to submit to grown-ups and especially your parents. Yeah, that she just has to make her understand rules and decorum and manners. And that's the real battle. And it's true that without rules and decorum and manners, she really would have lived like an animal for the rest of her life. And there's just absolutely no way a woman that smart would have been happy remaining like that. Well, the famous scene that goes on for, as you said, nine minutes... They cut outside here and there. It's not one steady shot or anything, but they also show a long shot of them, I think, early on. I wrote that down, long shot, so it must have been a fairly lengthy one if I noticed there was such a wide shot. You do get close-ups, of course, in the scene as well. But it really comes down to one simple thing. You're going to eat like a grown-up, or at least eat like a human being rather than do what you've been doing. Utensil, yeah. It's as simple as that. It isn't some bigger issue in this scene anyway. It's eat the way I tell you to eat. A true battle of the wills. This is just two stubborn characters determined to win, so determined that they really do a number on each other. Mm. They're all over the room, and there's so much that's remarkable they about that They were padding scene. in that scene, the two yes. actresses. Their performances are so fully committed. It made more sense to me when I learned that the two of them, Patty Duke and Anne Bancroft, had been doing the play for years. So it was Bancroft. Okay, right, yeah. Yes, they did it together. They had the chemistry together. They really understood how each other worked, and they obviously trusted each other a lot and that's got to be the only way you could get two actors especially one of those actors being a child to do this incredible feat and beyond that i find it extra striking that it's a woman and a girl to see them get this messy and sweaty and out of breath and just physical it feels radical like i could picture a man and a boy having a battle of wills that gets this physical and it not feeling that strange to me but even 60 years later I don't think I've ever seen a scene in a movie like this. There probably has been something. I can, well, they've done other versions of this TV well, movie. Well, okay, but I've never seen one. another version of the Miracle Worker. Well, by the way, speaking of that, Patty Duke played Annie and Melissa Gilbert played Helen in a 1979 TV movie. So the taught became the teacher 17 years later. But in that famous scene where they battle in the dining room and finally Annie wins enough, I guess it might be basically a tie, but I guess she wins. This is what I'm saying about not remembering everything. I wrote down, Helen folds her napkin, but trashes the dining room. So that's correct, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> Love that. Dining room's a mess, but she folded her napkin. <laughs> Fine, you win, but the dining room's ruined, so the poor maid has to fix all that stuff. Up. I know. Another advantage of wealth, they can just destroy every room they're in, and it could be someone else's problem to clean it up. But then Annie gets two weeks with Helen in a nearby cottage, which I guess is on their grounds. It's a lot of grounds, probably way out there. It's Cato Kalen's boathouse type of situation, I guess. <laughs> yeah, OJ came back with blood on him. I was miles away. Anyway, just a reference from almost 30 years ago. But she does get two weeks with Helen in a cottage, and that's a mess too. And that's one of the reasons why this movie works, I think. it's They meet up, and yet it gets violent and physical right away, and it's not just, okay, hit me, and I'll take it because you've got problems. And he fights back. Not badly, but she does push back on her. And the same thing happens there. So this is where they finally are, well, they don't connect in the cottage, but obviously things are progressing. And yet still, it's a mess, and Annie seems like she's about to, or basically is having a breakdown. She's crying. Helen's finally calmed down and is asleep. But Annie's not sleeping. This place is a mess, and she's weeping. One of the nice touches in the film is how Helen could be sleeping, and Mom and Dad show up, and they just have a full conversation while she's right there. Although it's interesting, they stand outside and talk through the window. And I read that before she met Anne Sullivan, and she was still a child, that Helen Keller would recognize members of her household by the vibration their feet made. Okay. Which I guess makes sense. When you have no other sensory data to pull from, you would learn acutely what someone smells like. This isn't and... just about sight and hearing, though, too, because I don't know if it'll get cut out of the podcast, but there's a few minutes ago where our newest foster dog came upstairs, and you might have heard the jing, 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 jingle bells <laughs> of her collar. You're not going to hear her little feet, granted, but you might have heard the jingle bells of her collar. We have a pretty squeaky hallway out there up on this level where the bedroom is when i'm in bed but awake even a little bit and you walk down the hall at all whether you come in the room or not i can hear you i can't feel it like she probably can but i can at least hear it so the notion okay i know she can't hear but the point is that i've got some kind of sensory thing that you're not going boom 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 but i can still hear you or at least sense you and feel you so why wouldn't she adapt and have that ability by Vibration. She has no other input to go by. Mm. We have friends who have a dog who's both blind and deaf. So did we. <laughs> this movie hits close to home because they're <laughs> what, six or so months ago, they're both alive, but Tilly might as well have been deaf and blind. We don't know for sure if she was either, but she probably was. 
And Sam literally was blind because his eyes have been gone for years. And he obviously had gone deaf in the last few months of his life. Started going deaf, yeah. So this movie hits very close to home. Yeah. Well, <laughs> let's stop comparing this poor girl to dogs. Well, it's what we know. <laughs> yeah, it's true. But when you were growing up in your house... If you heard someone's footsteps, I bet you knew which member of your well, family was. Well, my dad, was. for sure, is the heaviest one. So you would recognize. But I bet you knew if it was your sister, or your brother, or your mom, or your dad. I think I did, too, just based on their footfalls. Yeah. I like the scene where they can all be there together because naturally they can carry on a conversation. And Helen's not going to wake up. Yeah. And it's at this point in the film when things are starting to click and connect. And it feels like Anne's getting somewhere. Maybe the second best conflict in the film, which is the conflict with the mom... Of course, she's troubled by Anne's methods. Also, she would probably see this huge shift in strategy as a criticism of her skills as a mother. I wasn't good enough, yeah. I messed her up. Oh, this is my fault because I spoiled her? Well, yeah, it is. You love her, but her love for her is getting in the way. It's not what she needs right now. Yeah, but also, um, I believe that conflict. This is where the dad comes in and is like, you have two weeks. And I always say the same thing. <laughs> You've got 24 hours. It's just such a cheap thing that they put in screenplays because it's the easiest way to ramp up drama is to give an arbitrary deadline. You've got 24 hours times 14. Yeah. But the conflict with the mom is much more understandable because no matter how much you may have done wrong by your child by being lazy and giving in to her all the time, that woman loves her daughter. Anne wouldn't be there if she didn't love her daughter. They would have institutionalized her. Right, of course, yeah. Also, the name of the mother is Kate Keller. Cool name. And I made a note about how she looks like Emily Blunt. So if they ever redo this movie, yeah. Emily might want to play the Anne Sullivan role, but she really should play the mother role, even though she's not that old yet. But she looked so much like her. Inga Svensson plays her. Did you write down who the kid is that is used by Annie when they're still in the cottage to learn ASL? No, I mean, he didn't even really have a line, did he? So I didn't write him down. I can't remember his name. Because I wrote Percy, and yet I look at IMDb, it says Percy at age 10, implying it's a flashback scene. We get a lot of flashback scenes to Anne's youth. So how could it be that Percy is... Anyway, maybe I'm wrong with that. Whatever that kid's name is, though, they use him in the cottage, too. And it seems like... I think Helen must have recognized him somehow so it's almost like the safe person yeah well he's part of the household staff i think he's the maid's kid that's how you get some black people in this movie then as well well i'm sure they probably did have black servants well this is in alabama this isn't alabama they don't sound like it just like when we covered grumpy old men last week nobody sounds like they're from that area certainly none of the major actors do john gustafson is a swedish sounding name that would be in that area but nobody else sounds like they're from there and doesn't really have a name like that but at least you got a couple of black people in Alabama. Annie's time is supposed to be up. They're basically saying, okay, you've done a great job. We can work with Helen now. It's going to be okay. But during a dinner scene towards the end, Helen drops the napkin out of obstinance. And it's right back to Annie wanting to say, well, you got to discipline her and I'll do it. But then she's pandered to by her mother again. And then Helen acts up really badly. And that's what leads to Annie dragging her outside to pump the water. She says water, right? Or wah-wah. She says wah-wah. Yeah, yeah right. She finally gets it, and the ASL thing can work because she can do the sign. We see plenty of times that Bancroft is doing letters, L-I, whatever mm -hmm. the word is. Which is one of the ways that she communicated for the rest of her life. Even after Anne passed away, she always had a companion in her life that would communicate that way with her. But maybe the most remarkable thing about her, there's probably all these people already know this, but for some reason I just never learned about Helen Keller in school. She learned to talk. Oh, yeah. She was difficult to understand. And she said at the end of her life, one of her biggest failures or disappointments was that she could never speak clearly. But she learned by putting her hand on the voice box and the lips of the person speaking and mimicked it. Hmm. Remarkable, right? Yeah. Dedication to try to fit in the best she could. That's why I say this woman obviously was a very ambitious and capable and one of those people that clearly has to be busy and have a project at all times. So how torturous it must be to have been trapped. And again, it helps that she's not poor, so she can oh, yeah, just do course. this. The movie does end, though, with her still being this young, well, she's really a teenager, but supposed to be a little kid, connecting about the water thing and then heads over to be hugged by her family later that night. Annie's sitting on the porch, enjoying some time to herself. Helen comes out and hugs her. I think that's the last shot of the whole film. Arthur Penn did not want to include that. He wanted to end it in the front yard with the whole water scene. Okay. But the studio was like, no, you have to end on a sentimental, optimistic note. We have to see her say she loves her. I think To Kill a Mockingbird does something like that too, doesn't it? Same year as this. Very mm -hmm. inspirational movie as well. 
So Anne Bancroft was nominated for four other Oscars, including for The Graduate, where she's great. The movie really sags in the second half when she's not a part of it anymore, and it's not really that funny in the second half either, but she and Hoffman together, I guess you're less interested in over the years. <laughs> They're a great combination. One of my favorite comedy moments in any movie, and I'm not a huge Graduate fan, but it's when he grabs her boob, I think the first time they ever have sex in the hotel room, and she's scrubbing out a stain on her sweater, doesn't even acknowledge what he's doing at all. He goes up against the wall and bangs his head because Hoffman himself was trying not to laugh. <laughs> So yeah, she did The Graduate, that's her most famous movie, and many films with Mel Brooks, her husband, for many years. I didn't know she was in so many. And then even The Elephant Man, where he produced it but didn't direct it, that's a Lynch film. She's very good in that. Patty Duke didn't do that many other movies that stand out. Valley of the Dolls is one of the big ones later that decade in the 60s. I guess the biggest thing, though, beyond winning the Oscar and being great in this and the stage work is that she's Sean Astin's mom. That's right. And his dad was... John John Astin. Yeah, Gomez Adams in the movies, yeah. (laughs) Crazy. Yeah, John Aston did other things, but I think he's best known for that from the 90s, early 90s, Adam's Family films. I got to correct you. I get the rare, well, actually, here. He was not Gomez Adams in the movies. That was Raul Julia. He was Gomez Adams in the TV show. Right. You're correct. Had the Ooh, character right. Oh, that feels good. feels strange. I, I never get the, to correct you. I was incorrect on the medium. <laughs> <laughs> he was not in the films. He was in the show. That's correct. Well, Victor Jory does play the dad in this movie. He was born in the Yukon, so he's a Canadian actor. He worked forever, so he was in Gone with the Wind, and then later on Papillon, the Steve McQueen movie with Dustin Hoffman. Inga Svensson, or maybe it's Swenson, but SW, so probably Svensson. Anyway, mostly worked on the stage and in TV. And again, I'll say, looks so much like Emily Blunt. Or I guess Emily Blunt looks like her because she's a lot younger. She came later. She's a real beauty. Andrew Prine plays the brother James... He worked for 60 years. A lot of character work, but practically lived on TV. And the other actor I'll mention is the aunt, Ev, Kathleen Comegus, Comegus, C-O-M-E-G-Y-S. She was nearly 70 when she made this, so it was her final film and mostly did TV shows. And we never really talked about the character of James. What was the purpose of this contrarian little brat? Obviously, nobody got any discipline in this house because he's just there to be... A little jerk. You keep on saying little. Wasn't he grown? Yeah, he's grown. But you can still be a little jerk when you're grown. Yeah. I guess they needed a conflict. Yeah, that's exactly what it is. So the brother and the father We needed a naysayer. Well, we would be criticizing if we said, everybody's so supportive. Sometimes I'm sure that happens in real (laughs) life, but so rarely. We've criticized that plenty of times. I think we did that recently with something. Nobody is pushing back on this marriage or this thing or this that. Really? Everyone's okay. Oh, it was in Philadelphia. When I cover Philadelphia, that mm. one of the things that people criticize is that Andy's family is just Rockwellian and perfect. There's not one uncle that says, my nephew's one of them. Come on. Somebody would. A film that lots of people love that you hate is Lars and the Real Girl, which is right. the most guilty of this of anything I've ever seen. They all buy like it. Telling me some people might roll their eyes, but they all 100% go along with this absolutely ridiculous scenario. And this film, Miracle Worker... What makes it work is that the relationship, like we said, between Anne and Helen is so authentic and it's so flawed and they just feel like two believable people going through a conflict and messing up sometimes. But then, yeah, you have these antagonists that are straight from central casting, cliche, just there to spice up the script, I guess. But credit to Penn, because in a lot of movies, they would be way worse than they are. Yeah, you're right. We would hate them. We wouldn't just have issues with them. So Penn did direct us, went on to do Bonnie and Clyde, also did The Chase with Brando, Redford, Jane Fonda, and I think other big name actors, but those three especially. Now Redford and Fonda were still fairly new to acting and weren't really truly stars, but that is one big cast, or one great cast. A little Big Man with Dustin Hoffman as well, Alice's Restaurant. This was only his second movie after making The Left-Handed Gun with Paul Newman was his first. The writer William Gibson was mostly a playwright and wrote the stage play for this. Not a lot of other credits online for him but was nominated for an Oscar for this. you think he'd be inspired to write more screenplays or be recruited to do more screenplays, but didn't really. Also, you think that the science fiction novelist William Gibson would have added an initial to his name. <laughs> because it throws me every time you say it, every time I read it. So Gibson based it on Helen Keller's 1903 autobiography and his own 1959 play. Producer Fred Coe did produce The Left-Handed Gun for Penn and a Best Picture nominee later that decade, A Thousand Clowns. I know I've seen it, but I don't remember it. I think it won an Oscar for somebody, maybe supporting actor or something. The movie's 185 to 1. We watched it on TCM, I believe it was, a black and white print there. It's also on Canopy. Point is, it was available in many places. The cinematographer, Ernesto Caparos, he's a Cuban man or was a Cuban man, only shot a few other movies and some TV series, but didn't have that many credits. If he worked with Pentagon, I didn't see it. 
while Burnett Geffy shot and won an Oscar for Bonnie and Clyde. I know that. The cutter, Aram Abakian, or Avakian, he cut Mickey one for Penn, which was, I think, just after this, and Lilith for Robert Rawson. Say Lilith three times fast, or me one time fast. Lawrence Rosenthal was a prolific composer, did this and also A Raisin in the Sun the year before, and Beckett a couple years later. There's a movie, if you haven't seen, we probably should watch one day. Peter O'Toole and I think Burton is in that too. And I haven't seen it in a long time, but he did the music for that. So what'd you think of the look, the cutting, and the music? It's actually a really good looking film. Sharp, beautifully composed. The costumes were nominated for an Oscar. Did you think they should have been? I guess they had the advantage of being a period film. They were accurate. They were accurate. (laughs) All I could think the whole time is all the physical things she's doing and she Mm -hmm. looks like she's wearing a corset. I'm like, I would die. I wouldn't do that in jeans, let alone the dresses with the high collars that she's wearing. And maybe credit to the costumes and hair and makeup for letting the actors really look a mess. Part of the costume design is that Helen looks like she was raised by wolves at the beginning of the film. We talked on Magnificent Seven two weeks ago that the Mexicans had to be pristine, or at least their outfits had to be pristine. They because were the white Mexican clothes. Mexican government yep. insisted on it. Because you always make us look like we're dirty and all this, which was probably true mm-hmm. in the 50s and so on, leading into the 1960s or 1960 specifically. But they're wearing white. You'd see dirt on black clothes, let alone white clothes. Anyway, what happens next? Well, you can look up what happened to the real Helen Keller, and Bev's told you some of that stuff too. But what happens in my imagination? Well, the Kellers decide to put Annie permanently on the payroll. Well, then again, I didn't know that was true. I wrote this before I heard you say that. So it's real. (laughs) I didn't know it was real. Because she's the only one who can get through to Helen. And this family has the bucks. They can easily afford it. So you're in my what happens next. (laughs) Because it's real. (laughs) Facts. Stupid facts. Okay, well, Christmas is two weeks away. It's not really a Christmas movie, but you've got a title that implies that. I don't know if she's really working miracles, but she definitely has good patience. Understandably gets a little upset sometimes with somebody who is a terror anyway. But great performances, a solid movie. I guess I remembered it better than I thought I would. And definitely was a good film. Your last thoughts on Miracle Worker. Well, you had to figuratively drag me and place me in a chair and force me to watch this movie. You slapped me. <laughs> we slapped each other. It was a battle of wills. But I am um, thrilled to find it really exceeded my expectations. It's anything but homework. It feels surprisingly vibrant. The best thing about this movie is the honesty. Helen's far from a saint, but so is Annie. She wants to strangle Helen early on, then nearly has a complete breakdown in the cottage. These are very important scenes, probably based on reality. I guess so. And then also this hits close to home because of our dog, Sam and Tilly, that aren't that far away from being alive. Basically, we're Helen Keller. You say, well, compare them to dogs. Well, we're not the only people out there. They don't have kids, or they don't care about kids. They care about their cat, their dog, or both, or many of those types of pets. And we dealt with two creatures towards the end, especially Sam, that were like this. Well, actually, no, Sam is a good example comparing to Helen because he was obstinate anyway. I think if he'd oh, been... Because yeah. we got him as a dog who was clearly neglected, probably abused. If that never happened to him and he was with the family, it wouldn't be us because he's a Quebecois dog. He was from Quebec. <laughs> he is French. <laughs> <laughs> but wherever he was raised, if it had been a good life, I think he would have been a bit of a jerk anyway. Oh, for sure. That dog was naturally just a stubborn dog. So he went blind when he was six years old. They had to surgically remove his eyes. And the best advice that I ever got about how to treat him and how to train him and how to get him like accustomed to his new life was don't do everything for him. Do as little as you can possibly do. When he needs special accommodation, then sure. But the less you do for him, the better. And he showed us very quickly that he could do a lot. He figured everything out. Where the bowl is for water and for food, stumbling his way through the kitchens of our various places. And we moved three different times since he went blind. Well, four houses he had to learn his way around. But he would, we would take him to a new place and he would learn. He would just spend the first half hour wandering around. Okay. Yeah, I know which story you're going to tell. We really should end the podcast, but I got to tell the story since I'm laughing about interrupting your whole thing. Maybe I've mentioned this before. It still makes me laugh. We had recently moved to the house before this one, which was the third house he was in with no eyes. The pizza man came. You went down the fairly long hall to the front. He thought he was following you, losing his mind. Oh, kill that guy, that food delivery guy. He went the wrong way. And I didn't quite see it because I looked just as he started doing it, but he must have flown down the stairs. It was like a wily e. Coyote yep. moment. He was going so fast and he was so yep. determined that he was airborne. I didn't his hear legs were bump. still moving. I so think he hit the bottom of the stairs. I don't stairs. think he hit any of the stairs. I had gotten up by the time he was coming back up, though, because I think I saw him as he was doing one of those... <laughs> 
another thing. <laughs> That's Seriously. Not, did he just kill himself? Oh, no, he's fine. Oh, my God. The number of times that dog scared yeah. the life out of me. But that was actually a confidence inspirer for me because that just showed that he could go that hard down the stairs and be 100% he was, fine. He was stubborn. That was a good thing about his stubbornness is he never was going to let his blindness get in the way of doing anything he wanted. Helen Keller, Sam Ellis. <laughs> Same. <laughs> We yes. only compare her to a dog because we loved that dog so much. We don't have any kids. <laughs> so that was our take on The Miracle Worker. I'll be back at it on Friday as I try not to shoot my eye out with my dangerous BB gun while I watch a movie that TNT helped turn into a holiday staple by running 24-hour marathons on Christmas Eve and into Christmas Day, A Christmas Story. One of Bev's faves. Yeah. No, it's not. That's why I'm doing it on my own. <laughs> That's why it's just going to be me doing that one. Nobody you wants to hear me out. jump all over that out. movie. In seven days, though, this lady will be sitting in again and will be gearing up for Christmas by talking about a movie that the internet claims has seen set at that time of year, Trading Places. Even if the Christmas in it is minimal, Christmas scenes are minimal, bad grammar, we're overdue to review a John Landis movie we never have before, and yeah, we'll talk about Twilight Zone, and also get back to seeing Eddie Murphy in his prime. We've only covered a couple Eddie flicks in this channel in our 10-plus years of podcasting, I think it's just Beverly Hills Cop and Shrek. And Dan Aykroyd's not been covered a whole lot. And this was when he was big. Blues Brothers and SNL, of course. All right, the coming attractions trivia for Trading Places, a movie I haven't seen in a long time. It's going to feel like it's new to me. Every director has at least one movie on their resume that you like more than the more famous or critically acclaimed ones. John Landis directed landmark flicks like Animal House, The Blues Brothers, An American Werewolf in London, and, of course, Trading Places. He also directed Michael Jackson's music videos for Thriller and Black or White. Legendary names, right? We haven't watched Trading Places yet, but I've seen those other ones a few times each, and I just don't connect to very many of them the way that a lot of other people do. But I do connect big time to two other Landis films. I've probably mentioned them before over the years. Can you guess what those two films are? Oh, okay. And do you have one or two of your own Landis films you like more? Because this guy had one great run in the late 70s, early 80s. But I like other stuff he did. So, what are those two? So, for the answer to that question, check out next week's podcast about Trading Places. You already know how to find us, but let me remind you to favorite or subscribe wherever you listen, which is also where you can find our archive of hundreds of episodes that are available for free. And while you're there, why don't you leave us a rating or a review or both? We're both on Twitter, still. <laughs> I'm at Bev X. Ellis Ellis and Ryan is at MovieFiend51. Twitix. Or you can reach us by email, have you ever seen podcast at gmail.com. And you can find our podcast on YouTube. Our channel is at H-Y-E-S Ellis. And to enjoy freshly roasted premium coffee delivered straight to you in Canada or the U.S., please go to sparkplug.coffee slash H-Y-E-S and enjoy a 20% discount. I say this at the very end of the podcast, way too late, I guess, to do it, but happy Hanukkah for those who celebrate that. And, of course, Christmas is two weeks away from the day we post this. But in honor of Helen Keller, I'll say no more. And cut. <laughs>